Morning. Gumball of cushy. That, I don't know what just happened. Uh, that's the typical model of Cushing's in dogs and in humans is you have an excess ACTH from the anterior pituitary telling the adrenals to pump out a lot of cortisol. And that isn't always the case in PPID in horses. So back to this little schematic. <clears throat> Looking here at the, the blue circles, I don't know if you can actually see my, my pointer. Um, the intermediate lobe produces the, it produces a precursor called POMC um, that is further converted into ACTH. And the fate of ACTH in the intermediate lobe is mainly to be further converted into MSH. Uh, so very little ACTH from the intermediate lobe actually gets into systemic circulation in a normal horse. Most of the ACTH uh, comes from the anterior lobe. But what happens during PPID is that a lot of um, excess ACTH is being produced. Some of it gets converted into MSH as it should, but some of it also um, in excess gets um, secreted into the circu uh, circulatory system. So what are some of the symptoms of PPID? Um, most horses present with that abnormal shaggy hair coat uh, call, uh, known as hypertrichosis. Um, in late stage disease, there's usually a loss of muscle mass. These horses are often um, lethargic. They're predisposed to repeated hoof abscesses, um, chronic infections. They tend to have increased thirst and urination and breeding mares can uh, present with a decreased reproductive performance and sometimes inappropriate lactation. Oftentimes, and I think this is where Dr. Andrews can, can chime in, there can be um, accompanying insulin dysregulation or equine metabolic syndrome. And this kind of compounds the diagnosis because it involves um, another system entirely and um, the management becomes a little bit different if the horse is also insulin dysregulated. Um, if a horse is, is insulin dysregulated, they typically have excess insulin circulating um, and this also predisposes predisposes the horse to laminitis. And laminitis is what makes um, PPID and equine metabolic syndrome, um, I guess we'll say fatal. Uh, the, the diagnosis of PPID and EMS um, are not death sentences by themselves, but the complications that can arise from those diagnoses if not managed properly are what oftentimes lead to um, euthanasia. So diagnosing PPID, there, as we continue to learn more and more about um, what causes it and what, what dysfunctions, I guess, between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, um, we've kind of changed our, our methods of diagnosing. Right now, um, there is a, you can do a resting blood ACTH. Um, again, like I said, with the products from the intermediate lobe, there, it will be an excess of ACTH. And so um, you can just take a resting sample. The, the thing about ACTH is that it is seasonal. Uh, the horse does a lot of things seasonally, and so you have to account for the time of the year um, when you take those samples. But typically anything that's greater than 30 picograms per mil could be an indication of um, PPID. You can also do a TRH stimulation test. TRH stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone. Um, it's another uh, hormone that's released from the hypothalamus that will stimulate ACTH. And so in horses that have PPID, that ACTH response to TRH will be very exaggerated. Um, and so you take a blood sample before you give them TRH, and then you take a blood sample 10 minutes after you give them TRH. And if you see a much uh, an exaggerated response, then that's also an indication of, of PPID. Um, this interpretation of the results, this comes out of Tufts. And I think Dr. Andrews, you, I think, helped contribute to some of these parameters. Did you not? That, um, I think you're muted, Dr. Andrews. All right. Um, yeah, it's called the Equine Endocrine Group, and uh, it is uh, a group of us that uh, sort of review every other year the um, you know diagnosis and treatment of uh, PPID uh, and new clinical signs that emerge. Uh, we evaluate uh, treatments, other treatments, uh, including pergolide, um, and then come up with recommendations for uh, veterinarians uh, and certainly lay people too, and uh, looking at. Uh, uh, you know, making better, uh, better diagnosis, especially in the early cases. And you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Dr. Andrews, but uh, previously we kind of relied on the DEX suppression test. 
but that's kind of gone by the wayside, has it not? As we've learned more about it not necessarily involving adrenal output of cortisol. Right. Uh, the the current recommendation is to uh, to uh, measure resting ACTH and then follow that by a stimulation with uh, thyroid releasing hormone or TRH, um, and that's recommended uh, during the uh, the season from about November until July, and uh, and then there is a seasonal increase in ACTH. Uh, during the winter months, or well, during the fall and winter months, and uh, so um, uh, so measuring just the resting ACTH in those times is is a good uh, indicator. Uh, but we've gotten away from using uh, cortisol because it um, can uh, change quite a bit in these horses with uh, can be uh, variable in these horses that have PPID, and also we have to give them dexamethasone, which is a um, which could lead to laminitis. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to think that no, we gave them such a small dose it could never, never get laminitis from the, from giving dexamethasone. But uh, we've had a few horses that found her on just the uh, giving them the intravenous dose of uh, the dexamethasone. So we uh, we're now uh, currently uh, so variable, and then because we have to give an ex, uh, exogenous dose or you know a dose of dexamethasone, we've gotten away from using that. Uh, that dexamethasone suppression test. Right. If you um, also suspect accompanying dis insulin dysregulation, then that would be um, indicative of a, a glucose or in a glucose tolerance or an insulin tolerance test. Um, there's a lot of, I guess it depends on, on your clinic or your particular um, method, but there's IV glucose tolerance test, oral glucose tolerance test, um, IV insulin tests. Um, so that could be an accompanying diagnosis um, if you suspect that your horse is also insulin dysregulated. So managing a horse with PPID. Um, the, the, I think the, the most common thing right now, especially if there's no accompanying um, insulin dysregulation, is to restore that dopamine activity. And there are several, several drugs out there that will mimic the action of dopamine. The one that's available for horses is known as Persend. Um, the compound in it is pergolide. And basically what it's meant to do is restore that dopamine input to the pituitary, uh, therefore reducing ACTH. Um, it does reduce ACTH and it will improve the outward symptoms of PPID. Uh, these horses do typically improve. They, they shed that, that shaggy coat. The one thing that um, restoring that dopamine activity will not do is it will not improve insulin sensitivity if your horse is insulin dysregulated. That's been some of the focus of the research that's come out of LSU is uh, we've worked with quite a few different dopamine um, agonists or drugs that act like dopamine, and we have found that, that none of them actually alter or improve insulin resistance um, for those horses that are insulin dysregulated. So that's where if you also have accompanying um, insulin dysregulation, that's where nutritional management um, becomes key. Uh, these horses, you want to uh, avoid diets that are high in starch, so you want low concentrate. Um, you may even have to uh, limit their grazing, especially in those times of years where those pastures are high in sugars. Um, you want to keep a low glycemic index, so you don't want to stimulate um, excess insulin because these horses are usually, um, usually have excess insulin anyway. Low calorie if uh, the horse is obese. Um, some anecdotal therapies that don't necessarily, that, that have some history of, of showing signs of improvement, but not necessarily backed by a, a, a great deal of science. Um, diets that are high in antioxidants. One of the theories about the loss of dopaminergic input to the pituitary is that um, those dopamine neurons have been damaged by oxidative stress. And so by feeding diets high in antioxidants, you might be protecting those dopamine neurons, um, therefore restoring or at least preventing further degradation. Um, vitamin E and C supplementation have also been implicated, as well as omega-3 supplementation. One thing about horses with PPID is uh, they need to be managed, um, as any horse, you know, well-managed with um, good husbandry, regular hoof care, regular dental care. Um, hoof care is important, especially for these horses that have um, chronic abscesses and chronic hoof problems. 
Um, so regular farrier care um, and Dr. Andrews, did you have any more to add? I think that's where I was. So the 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 fate of a horse with PPID, um, they they can live a good life if managed properly. Um, it depends. The, the the thing about PPID is that they're it's, it's a continuum. They have um, varying, you know, as the disease progresses, there are um, you know, increasing severity of symptoms, and so. Um, trying to catch it early, um, that horse has a, a pretty good prognosis of living a good life. Um, late stage is where you get into a lot of the hoof problems and sometimes can lead to euthanasia. So I'll let Dr. Andrews, the veterinarian, uh, weigh in on more of a, a clinical um, approach to managing horses with PPID and then EMS. Right. Um, I think one of the things that uh, should be mentioned, uh, and I'll uh, cover that a little bit, um, uh, is we did a study looking at long-term survival in these horses. And if people, um, you know, once you dispense the pergolide, how many people actually treat their horse uh, over that period of time? And we did find that 98% uh, of people um, or the uh, people that we phoned back uh, treated their horse. Uh, and they also said that they had a second horse that had PPID, they would treat, treat that horse. So, um, but, and then one of the things in that study, um, and uh, I'll share the results, uh, but uh, in that study, we, um, when we surveyed uh, the clients um, that brought horses with PPID into the clinic, they didn't really bring the horse in and say, I'm bringing my horse in because it has PPID. They brought it in because it had some secondary complication that might have been associated with uh, PPID and that's laminitis uh, or it had a dental um, a tooth abscess, tooth, tooth root abscess, um, or it had sinusitis or uh, an infection somewhere uh, that was probably associated or pneumonia because the horse uh, had long hair coat. Um, and so people, um, you know, clients, uh, when they bring the horse in, they don't necessarily say, well, the horse has PPID, um, but they say, well, you know, it has an infection. Uh, it seems to be uh, eating slower. Um, and so I brought it in and then we noticed right away that there, it has a curly hair coat. Um, and so, gee, you know, this horse has uh, likely had PPID. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is show a quick video um, of the, um, uh, just of, uh, kind of follow up what Aaron was saying, uh, and I think it, uh, it's very helpful um, to, uh, for people to get sort of an idea of what that, uh, um, of what that, uh, you know, kind of the, where everything, where the. Hey, Dr. Andrews, I think you need to unmute yourself because we can't hear you. Can you hear it now? Can you turn it up on your speaker? Turn it on? Turn the speaker up. Oh, turn my speaker up? No. Yeah, because I can't hear any of that. Okay. Can you hear it now? Mm, not real well. Not real well, yeah. Is that better now? No. No. Why don't you do me a favor? Um, I'll just share that link um, to this video underneath the Zoom video that we're doing right now. Okay. Just do a link to it. Yep. Yeah. They can see it so they can hear it themselves. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Because I have my. So. So you want to try it again or just uh, skip it? Just skip it. Okay. You're on mute. <laughs> there you go.
yeah, go ahead and, and finish with your uh, your presentation. Okay, now I'm figuring out how to get back to the, uh, uh, let me see here. Oh, uh, stop share. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay, there we go. It's always uh, interesting to figure out uh, how everything works. Um, so I have a I have a few slides here uh, that I think, um, and I and I know um, Aaron's covered most of this. Um, and you, everybody see the slides, okay? So I'm just going to go. Um, Aaron covered most of this, uh, so I'll just go through kind of um, uh, just reiterate if you go to that um, if you just type in on your google search type in equal group uh, it'll take you to um, their the website that we currently have and if you want to kind of review some of the clinical signs associated with ppid uh, there are early clinical signs and you can see those along the left uh, left hand side uh, and then there's advanced clinical signs uh, and one of the one of the things that we do note in the early clinical signs is that laminitis and recurrent uh, sole abscesses, um, which again um, likely people bring their horse in uh, because it has a laminitic episode uh, because it didn't really um, have any reason it didn't get into the to the uh, feed uh, bunk and and eat uh, you know a, a whole bag of grain um, or have some underlying condition uh, road found or things like that so. Um, and uh, um, when we look at horses, um, if, you, if you look at horses that uh, may be on your um, place or borders, uh, uh, you see the one on the, uh, the left here, um, that's the pretty typical horse, uh, but we have other horses here uh, that uh, have variable shedding. This is uh, a horse named Medusa that we had at, uh, at uh, the University of Tennessee, and she shed off very well, but she foundered uh, one um, one spring when they turned her out on the pasture, um, and uh, she sheds off pretty nicely. But she's and she's only eight years old, so re relatively young horse. Um, then this horse is kind of has that intermediate coat. Had a it has a, a show clip there, a saddle clip, um, so that uh, you know it can cool off a little bit. Uh, uh, but again, it doesn't have to have that uh, that real uh, fluffy uh, curly hair coat like these horses here. They're pretty pretty obviously have uh, pituitary adenoma. Um, and then uh, one of the things that we have noticed too in these clinical signs is this uh, um, uh, super orbital fat pad uh, that becomes pretty prominent in these horses uh, that have um, uh, that have uh, PPID, um, not necessarily EMS. Uh, although some people feel EMS might be a precursor uh, to PPID. Um, I don't know if I'm in that, uh, um, in that uh, um, group, but uh, certainly uh, because EMS, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about equine metabolic syndrome, uh, but because it's, uh, it has your horse's fat um, and then it also is insulin resistant and then perhaps has uh, evidence of laminitis, there's a lot of inflammation going on in that horse, and that inflammation could lead to degeneration uh, of the uh, hypothalamus and those nerves that supply the um, uh, that uh, uh, pituitary gland. So, uh, so it could be that that's uh, one of the things that we uh, are are looking at. So, and uh, Aaron covered this very nicely uh, that uh, horses over 15 years of age in the, a study that was done in um, actually in Australia by uh, Kathy McGowan showed that 85% uh, of the horses were 15 years or older. Um, and there didn't seem to be any breed or gender um, predilections, uh, but ponies had a higher incidence. And so if you have a pony, you'll wanna check that pony out a little bit more um, and uh, on, a, on a yearly basis. And we do recommend that if you're, um, as you uh, see your veterinarian, try to have a ACTH uh, um, done once a year, uh, usually just before the spring vaccinations, uh, when your horse gets to be 15 years of age. And then as that ACTH is increasing uh, yearly, then you might want to uh, evaluate uh, that a little closer for PPID. Um, and then, of course, obviously, uh, you know, looking at your horse for um, to see if it's getting fatter, uh, especially if you're on a high grain diet. Um, and then these are the things, the 
they're more susceptible to diseases, um, which uh, uh, Aaron uh, talked about, which was great. So, um, but if you see these things occurring um, in your horse, uh, then um, it's a very good idea to have that horse looked at uh, because there may be some underlying uh, condition uh, like uh, PPID uh, or EMS that might be causing some of these things. And then, of course, these are also associated conditions. Uh, you know, your horse might have wounds that don't heal up very well. Um, and then we have had some younger horses uh, with big, uh, large pituitary glands that actually uh, either go blind or have seizures. Um, and so we've had uh, some of those horses that present uh, persistent lactation, which uh, Aaron mentioned uh, in that. And this is that study that we did uh, um, and looking at uh, was actually 44 horses that uh, were presented for uh, pituitary adenomas. Um, and we actually, um, uh, they were uh, donated or they, um, and they were, um, uh, if, if the client, uh, uh, they were pretty much in advanced stages. And so the client uh, uh, put some of them to sleep. So, and then we kept a lot of them until they passed away uh, at uh, LSU. Um, but there was a, it's kind of interesting when you say, well, um, when does the onset of clinical signs, um, you know, uh, sort of go with the, um, um, you know, the diagnosis? Well, you can see on the first line here that uh, anywhere from one day to five years, um, you know, people, um, you know, clients uh, um, made the diagnosis uh, after they noticed the clinical signs. And then uh, one of the things you, your veterinarian might do is if the horse has an unusually long hair coat, uh, there really isn't uh, any other disease that causes that unusual long hair coat. And so they recommended that uh, if, you know, over 90% of the horses with a long hair coat have pituitary adenomas or, or um, PPID. Um, and so we did notice in that study that geldings were more susceptible. Um, and it seems like a little bit more in, um, in EMS too, is that geldings, uh, do have, uh, especially the, the overweight geldings, uh, tend to, to, to maybe be a little bit more prone to the EMS, although mares uh, certainly uh, get that also. And this is the interesting thing, is that the mean survival rate in those horses, on the 44 horses, uh, was 4.6 years, uh, and that was the, the median survival rate, so that's half of them lived 4.6 years. Um, in that study, and the longest horse lived 6.2, 6.4 years. So that uh, it's it's good to know kind of how long is my horse going to live once it's diagnosed. So you know you still have uh, a horse that's uh, going to live between uh, you know four and six years. Um, so that horse um, um, you know is going to be uh, you know a, a functional horse. Um, and the response to treatment uh, on the on uh, uh, pergolide uh, was about 40 percent. Uh, uh, but in the studies with pergolide, it was showed that 70% of the horses responded. Uh, so, um, so it was a little bit lower in this study. Um, and then this is the kind of the last uh, thing here is 97% of owners would treat the second horse uh, with PPID. So that was one of the things we wanted to see if, if uh, clients were willing to treat a second horse and most of them were so in that particular study. Um, and so basically when you look at long-term survival, um, you know, half the horses lived uh, almost five years, which is good, uh, and the longest survivor was 6.4 years. Uh, uh, and these were, again, older horses uh, that came in with advanced disease. So, um, and then the most common cause of death in horses with PPID, of course, is euthanasia because they have all these secondary complications associated with that. Um, and then, um, so if we want to look at uh, how PPID and uh, equine metabolic syndrome are, um, uh, are related, uh, we can kind of look at these things and see, um, you know, how these things, uh, so this, uh, the big thing with uh, uh, equine metabolic syndrome, basically you're looking at horses that are uh, obese, you know, the, the fat, kind of the fat horse, a typical EMS horse is fat, um, and, uh, you know, they're younger horses. They're usually less than 15 years of age, um, and they're on a high plane of nutrition, um, and they're, they tend to be, uh, there's some breeds, uh, the next slide uh, has some breeds that are 
that are more uh, prone to obesity uh, and laminitis. Um, but we also have this group of, uh, so, uh, so uh, EMS is uh, really insulin resistance, uh, the fat horse, uh, we call it adiposity or regional adiposity. So the fat horse, uh, insulin resistance, uh, and then um, the uh, laminitis. Or if you say, well, my horse has never really had laminitis before, but if you um, start looking at the hooves, you'll see some lines in those hooves. And so the horse might have had a mi very mild bout of laminitis and inflammation in those feet. And so they have this reoccurring laminitis. Um, and they tend to be younger horses, again, uh, less than 15 years of age. Um, they tend to be a bit overweight. Although we do see this, uh, these horses that are lean, uh, that have EMS, uh, and those are the ones that are most difficult to manage uh, because, again, they're skinny. Uh, if you have a fat horse that, is, uh, that has, uh, you know, some insulin resistance issues and laminitis, um, you can, um, you know, basically uh, put them on a diet um, and then uh, decrease their body weight. And that does a, a tremendous amount for improving their insulin resistance. So just dietary um, you know, lower carbohydrate diet, um, and then uh, soaking the hay is very good. If you have, uh, uh, we, we really would like uh, to have um, uh, clients uh, uh, weigh their hay out uh, when they feed it and also soak their hay um, and then uh, get it analyzed for sugar content uh, because the high sugar, some of these uh, grass hays can have a fairly high sugar uh, content in them. Um, so it would be good to have those analyzed, but if not, you can certainly soak it. And this is a 30 minutes of soaking uh, in complete water. And that uh, kind of gives you under, you know, completely underneath the water so that then the uh, sugar content is leached out in the water. And so there's less sugar uh, in that, uh, in that hay. And then we have the, of course, the PPID group, uh, which, uh, you know, overlap uh, with these. We see these uh, obese uh, EMS horses uh, that uh, also have PPID. Uh, and this is sort of that, uh, the link that some people think uh, they get EMS, they're uh, obese, and they go for a long period of time, they get these uh, degeneration, uh, oxidative damage uh, to these nerves uh, in the uh, uh, hypothalamus, and then the nerve regulation of the pituitary uh, is reduced, and there's um, then it allows that flood of ACTH out in the blood uh, and then the, uh, the damage that's caused. So, um, and then, um, so that we, we see that link um, and we do recommend uh, insulin resistance testing uh, in horses that have EMS as well as PPID. Um, and uh, typically your veterinarian, uh, there's several tests uh, as Aaron uh, mentioned, uh, the uh, intravenous insulin uh, test. Um, but um, currently what most veterinarians are doing uh, is using caro syrup. Um, they give a dose of caro syrup orally, uh, measure uh, glucose before and insulin, uh, and then uh, give that, uh, um, give the uh, glucose and then uh, afterwards measure uh, the amount of glucose in the blood, and then the insulin concentrations, which tell if, uh, tell them if you have insulin, if the horse has insulin resistance. So, so I think it helps. And this uh, diagram, if you're interested, is in on the equine uh, endocrine group uh, website, um, and it's uh, there's two uh, large PDFs there uh, that give you uh, all the information you really need to, uh, um, you know, to uh, to know about. Uh, uh, PPID and uh, equine metabolic syndrome. Um, and this is a little bit of uh, in what we call signalment, which is the um, age, breed, and sex of horses, um, and then the clinical features. Uh, and these are the typical obese horse uh, that has the equine metabolic syndrome. Um, and they, uh, so there's a genetic risk uh, for, uh, we, we think it, it, it implies that there's certain breeds that have um, you know, that are more prone to being uh, overweight um, and uh, that have uh, EMS. Um, and then also uh, these uh, breeds include the pony breeds. Uh, so if you have a pony, um, you need to keep that pony um, at, a, at a good weight uh, for, that, uh, for that pony. And then Andalusians, then the gated breeds, saddlebreds, pasofinos, tend to have um, 
uh, tend to be more uh, predisposed. Uh, and then Morgan's, uh, um, when I was at the University of Tennessee, we actually had a, a group, I think eight Morgan's, uh, Dr. Nichols Frank had those up there uh, and did extensive studying with those. And then miniature ponies, uh, miniature horses, uh, really miniature horses, but, and then some warm bloods. Uh, um, and then uh, there is some uh, data out there that suggests maybe there is a, a, a some risk with donkeys as well. And then if we look at the clean, uh, clinical features, uh, um, you know, um, and again, if just because there's not all these typical clinical signs present, uh, doesn't mean that your horse couldn't have EMS. And that's why it's, if you're having some issues with your horse or it seems to be overweight, um, and you're what you're uh, concerned about it uh, then getting it having having it looked at by a veterinarian would be very helpful uh, but weight loss uh, you know we're really resistance to weight loss so there's the easy keepers the good doers that we see uh, oh my horse is you know it's an easy keeper I feed it wind and wire and it still gains weight um, and uh, but you know you'll have to look and see because a lot of uh, people say well my horse is out my clients say my horse is out in the pasture, um, and uh, so it has very little to eat, but when you go out there, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of grass, and that horse will seek out the grass uh, and feed it right away. And then laminitis, uh, subclinical and clinical laminitis, um, sometimes uh, just looking at the hoof wall, um, and then the crusty neck appearance, uh, which is pretty typical, um, and then uh, subcutaneous uh, fat deposits, um, and then, of course, clinical problems, uh, they may either be historical or current uh, in that horse. In other words, the laminitis might have occurred as a subclinical um, disease uh, rather than something that uh, completely makes the horse lame. So, and uh, these are, uh, this is just some recommendations uh, for PPID um, for a treatment. And this is from the equine endocrine group as well. Uh, in the PPID, so in the stimulation test, um, and then resting ACTH. Um, and then um, if you're looking at uh, insulin, uh, as your veterinarian comes out and says, well, we, we would like to measure resting insulin and glucose concentrations. Um, so we do recommend that the horse is off pasture uh, and on uh, just a, a regular grass hay um, uh, for at least 24 hours. Um, and then because that grass hay can, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the, the pasture can have a lot of sugar uh, in that grass uh, and can uh, artificially increase the glucose. And then as the glucose goes higher in the blood, then the insulin responds and is higher um, to uh, take care of that glucose. Um, and then collect a blood sample first thing in the morning, usually before feeding and then no stress. It's really good to do these out on the farm, this testing. And then measure ACTH at the same time uh, because there is that link between EMS and uh, uh, PPID, especially if your horse is in that 15 years uh, of age, then you'll want to start uh, looking uh, for the, at the ACTH again. Um, and then, um, uh, so then you're going to look at also insulin uh, concentrations, and then in that uh, your veterinarian will um, evaluate the insulin uh, and glucose at the lab and then get back to you. And we have, uh, you know, if there's a, if the insulin is greater than 20 uh, uh, micro units per mil, then it's suspect and then at over 30 uh, would mean that it is positive with the, uh, with the testing. So. Um, and then I just uh, some things on uh, uh, detection of PPID and Aaron covered those. Um, and then uh, key points again, um, measuring uh, the ACTH um, in those areas. And then I think, uh, you know, the last thing on here, it's very important for these PPID horses to go ahead and look at insulin levels as well. Because again, there is that link between insulin resistance and PPID. And we want to be sure that we don't miss that uh, when we're evaluating uh, our horse. And it just is uh, actually that I was talking about that eight-year-old horse that came in with seizures. And uh, this horse, uh, this is actually the pituitary here. Uh, and this is after contrast. This is a, a CT scan uh, on the horse. Uh, the pituitary should be about this big. It should be a tiny, couldn't, should hardly be able to see it. But this horse had a huge uh, pituitary gland and it was causing that horse to have seizures and be a neurologic 
and it was only an eight-year-old horse, so it could occur in that. Uh, and these are the CT scan. There, it takes uh, slices uh, uh, through the brain and uh, spinal cord in these horses, uh, and it doesn't, you know, cause any trauma. And we just have to anesthetize them. So it gives us uh, a little bit of an idea. We did publish uh, that as a case report uh, in that horse. So, and these are just some uh, pictures of horses with PPID uh, before and after pergolide uh, treatment. I uh, thought, you know, you'd wanna just uh, see some of these, uh, these horses. Um, you can see um, there's a dramatic uh, improvement in these horses uh, after uh, uh, treatment. And these, all these horses were enrolled in the pergolide trials, which LSU was involved with uh, the pergolide trials uh, for the FDA approval of that drug. Um, and again, you can see uh, this horse, just tremendous amount of, um, you know, uh, response to treatment um, in these horses. So, um, and then um, Aaron did uh, make a comment about this too, water intake. Um, again, um, we can't really measure urine output, although if you're, if you think your horse might be uh, uh, drinking so much, you'll notice that if it's a stalled horse, it will have lots of, um, uh, urine in the stall, and you might have to clean it out two or three times a day. Um, and then uh, uh, some of the things, this is monitoring for treatment. Um, you can monitor water, uh, monitor water intake, uh, reduction of clinical signs and loss, the losing of the hair, more activity. Uh, and then, of course, we can look at uh, some of these other things, uh, decrease in blood glucose, um, which is associated with the ACTH. Um, in these uh, horses. And it doesn't really, pergolide doesn't help with insulin resistance, uh, but sometimes it will reduce uh, blood glucose levels a little bit in that. So, um, and then uh, again, you can't emphasize enough as Aaron did that the horse has to, you have to manage the whole horse uh, with these uh, proper nutrition, hoof care, dentistry. Um, some people body clip their horse, uh, um, again, to try to prevent it from sweating in the summertime. Um, and then we always recommend a geriatric wellness program uh, and yearly evaluations uh, of ACTH in your old horse. Uh, and then as soon as that ACTH starts creeping up, uh, then you can start a very early on uh, percent. Um, and it's just a once a day treatment. Uh, the pill is, uh, um, you know, uh, very small uh, and it dissolves in water uh, in 11 and a half seconds. Um, and it can be just injected into the mouth uh, orally uh, with the syringe, um, not with the needle on, of course, with the needle off. Um, and then just a take home message, um, basically, um, you know, one of the things as we get down here, insulin sensitivity and then ruling out EMS, especially in the younger horse. Um, you know, if your horse is less than 15 years of age, you want to uh, make sure that it's not, uh, doesn't have EMS. Um, or that doesn't have uh, insulin sensitivity issues um, in these horses. Because remember, when you start them on pergolide, it's a, it's a lifelong treatment. So um, we wanna be sure we have the right diagnosis before you put a horse on uh, treatment for PPID. And then uh, you probably didn't know, uh, but uh, uh, Darth Vader was Darth veterinarian before he went over to the dark side. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that, that's kind of my take on a mixture of EMS and PPID, which can be difficult uh, to separate uh, the two. Uh, but the big thing is, uh, you know, the age and, uh, you know, having your veterinarian evaluate uh, uh, both PPID and EMS. Okay, let me go ahead and uh, push this off on the sharing here. Stop share. Okay, great. Great job. Thank you, guys. Um, I think everybody's you guys have covered all of the things and, and how we want to manage these horses anybody on have any specific questions before we wrap up um i do have a um a little bit of a question you know how dr andrews you said that um there's some school of thought that these ems horses may be the precursor as these horses age to get into a ppid situation um some of the research that i was doing before we jumped on this call this morning kind of indicated that we may play a large role in starting EMS in horses at a very young age, as far as even feeding foals. Um, have you seen any additional research on, on how we may feed our horses as their babies and kind of transitioning off of mare milk 
um, into maybe a training program as a, a yearling two-year-old that may predispose these horses even further? Well, I think there is a, um, and maybe Eric can speak to that too, because um, you know you guys uh, uh, do a lot of nutritional studies too. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that is a is a myth, um, you know, with feeding horses, is that they need a lot of grain. Um, you know, horses need to be fed, uh, um, you know, sweet feed and uh, all the. And if you look at the, if you just go to uh, one of the feed companies' websites, uh, there's so much, uh, you know, packaged uh, grains out there. Um, and uh, we had a client come in the other day with a uh, uh, fat pony and a fat uh, fat horse. Uh, and they said, uh, so we said, well, what's your your diet? And both of them had uh, sore feet. And uh, they said, well, we're feeding 1.5% uh, of the body weight in, uh, they didn't actually say that, but they said they're feeding 1.5% of the body weight in grain um, and 0.5% in hay. And they said the hay was just for, uh, you know, a treat. Um, and, uh, but I think some people, uh, you know, they see these complete feeds um, and they say, well, you know, we're, we're just going to feed that, uh, you know, they think that, um, uh, that, a, that a um, sweet feed is a complete feed. And so they feed a lot of that. But I think we get the horses started too, too young into that creep feeding and really pretty high uh, sugar content in the horses. And I know if you talk to the farm managers, they like that sweet feed because it, um, you know, tends to make their horses look a little nicer in the coat. Um, but of course, they're a lot fatter too. Uh, Aaron, you might speak to that. Uh, I know you guys have done a lot of work and you too, Neely, as far as nutrition. I think I just echo that statement. I think my personal approach to feeding horses is that, you know, you have to go back to the basics and that they, they evolved to eat grass. Um, they were never really designed to eat um, grains and they may love it, but um, it's very easy to cross a line where you're putting too much emphasis on, on your grain and not enough emphasis on, on the quality pasture, quality hay that you're feeding. So I, I echo your statement completely in that me personally, um, if a horse can be managed or maintained on, on hay or pasture alone, um, you're going to save yourself a whole lot of, of headache or metabolic conditions or things like laminitis or colic um, if you just allow that horse to be a horse and eat. Um, now, granted, there are definitely cases where the horse is in extreme work or obviously lactating or maybe just a hard keeper and definitely supplementing some sort of energy um, is necessary. So there are definitely cases where, you know, supplementing those concentrates are appropriate. But um, as a, my personal approach to feeding horses is only supplement concentrates if they're lacking nutrients from um, the good quality uh, hay or forage that they're grazing. Yeah, I would agree. I think the one of the things that I, I do think that can become an issue and that we need to do to be mindful of it is when we're taking horses, especially young horses, when we're pulling them off of pasture and then bringing them in as, you know, a, a long yearling or as a two-year-old and we're starting to begin their training regimen, we really do need to think about adding additional calories and supporting them nutritionally as they're, they're still growing, which is energetically very expensive. And they're also um, being asked to perform at a higher uh, level um, than, than they were just standing out in the pasture. So I do feel like it's important to feed these horses as we're transitioning them from a pasture horse to a training horse that's also growing and trying to maintain all those vitamins and minerals that are essential to quality bone growth and, and mus musculature development. Um, but I do think as um, you know, horse enthusiasts and horse lovers, we're all in this because we, we love what we do and we love our horses. Um, but we do need to be mindful that we're not overfeeding those babies and not predisposing them to um, you know, this insulin resistance situation and potentially PPID situation as they get older. Um, we do have a question from Jenna. She says that chromium is recently being approved to aid in insulin resistance. She's curious if we have any opinions on the use of chromium in horses that have PPID or EMS. I think Aaron touched a little bit on uh, some of the uh, supplements that are being touted now for, uh, and I know there's Chastine Berry, there's a variety of other supplements, chromium piclinate. Uh, but, um, you know, I think when you uh, look at the, the data, there's probably not a whole lot of data out there that supports, um, you know, and I mean, these are controlled studies. 
uh, that um, you know actually show that uh, it does improve insulin resistance. Um, and uh, there's just the studies out there. And I think one of the things that you, you, I do notice is that the uh, companies that sell the supplements, they're very good at marketing the supplements uh, with very little, um, very little data. Um, and uh, so I would uh, um, certainly, um, I, you know, some, most of the supplements don't really hurt horses. Um, but um, the other thing is you want to make sure that if you're um, feeding other supplements that doesn't have uh, chromium in there, um, and so you're not double dipping on the, on the supplements. So, um, and then also if you can do a, uh, if you want to go uh, and have a, a look at the literature, um, you know, and what's on that, you could go to Google Scholar. Uh, and then in your, uh, once you get to Google Scholar, you can type in uh, chromium and insulin resistant in horses, and it will give you some of the papers that are out there. And you can look and see if those are uh, papers, uh, you know, if there's any papers uh, that, uh, you know, scientific literature uh, that, um, you know, support the chromium. Uh, but I don't know of anything, Aaron, you might, uh, you could, you could probably um, um, speak to that as well. But there are no, there's no scientific studies, controlled studies that said, you know, we fed 10 horses that were insulin resistant, 10 horses, normal horses, um, and uh, the insulin resistant horses after being fed chromium, uh, we're all not no longer insulin resistant. Um, one of the things I would add is that uh, we are currently doing a study uh, with uh, uh, CoQ10 uh, in horses, and we have seen some promising results, uh, uh, but it, like with every research study, it's in the very preliminary stages. Um, so I think there are probably some supplements out there that might be helpful, but um, we are not sure what those are yet. Aaron, you could probably. I, I agree completely with that. You know, we, there are a lot of, uh, of anecdotal therapies out there. The, the supplementation of uh, vitamin E or, you know, to uh, combat free radicals as an antioxidant. But I know that um, uh, Dr. McFarland, who has done a lot of research with PPID in horses, she did a controlled study that looked at oxidative stress as a, um, a cause, we'll say, of PPID and didn't really find um, an association there. So again, I agree with you completely that while a lot of these therapies are being marketed for PPID, and yes, they may improve them. There's there's not a lot of controlled studies that you know will say, oh, all the horses that we treated with this, the chromium, the omega threes, the you know the whatevers, um, they all improved. You know, so that we kind of take that as a, as tenuous data, and we don't necessarily disregard it, but it's not. Uh, considered dogma yet. So I agree with you yeah, completely. We, well, one of the things when I brought up the CoQ10 is we're uh, involved in a study with Washington State University um, and they were, uh, they wanted, uh, they actually tried to enroll some horses that had EMS, but they didn't have very many. So uh, since, um, you know, uh, the Ag Center has the the horses are a little bit uh, fat, you know. We're, so we're good at keeping our uh, fat mares. <laughs> so we, um, we actually, um, we had uh, four uh, horses that were uh, super insulin resistant in that group. And so we fed uh, two the CoQ10 and two uh, we did give the supplement to. And of course, like every research project, uh, one of the horses insulin resistant went away with a CoQ10 and the other one didn't have any change at all. So, <laughs> so, um, and uh, so uh, the other two of course stayed insulin resistant that were, were not treated. Uh, but I guess they're in Washington State, they're having some effect with that. But uh, like I said, hopefully uh, we'll get some data published uh, that can be used. The final line of all of that is more research is needed. <laughs> yeah, that's <Sorry>. right. <laughs> all right, so take home message for all of our, our folks watching and all of our um, stakeholders that actually are trying to manage horses with Cushing's or a PPID situation. Is there life after PPID diagnosis? So um, I'll, I'll uh, say, I'll give uh, Aaron the last word. So, uh, but, um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, in, in the study that we did, and we had those very same questions, you know, we, we were, we're seeing uh, horses with PPID now, and whether we're seeing more horses or just we're better at diagnosing it now than we used to be, uh, used to be, you know, if the horse had curly hair coat, we'd make an assumption. Now we're, you know, we have sophisticated testing uh, that can pick up these uh, 
cases earlier, uh, but when we uh, did that study, uh, we were really encouraged that people um, continue to treat their horse, uh, you know, four and a half uh, to six years after uh, it was diagnosed and put on pergolide, which is great. Um, and then we have that, um, you know, this, the horse is going to live, going to live a while uh, after it may has a diagnosis. So it's not a, not the end of the world. Um, and, um, and also, um, you know, as, as far as EMS horses, um, I think, uh, you know, if you need nutrition, um, and, and, uh, and Neely is very good at giving nutritional information. You can also, uh, from the major feed companies, uh, they can uh, help you with, uh, you know, uh, feeding your horses, um, you know, to try to decrease the amount of obesity uh, in the horses, especially if you have one of those predisposed breeds uh, like a Morgan or Andalusian uh, saddlebred. Um, and um, so, uh, but I'm not saying, um, you know, that uh, every horse uh, of that breed is going to be overweight, but just watch it, uh, watch your horse. Uh, and then what we do recommend is the horse gets over 15 years of age is to have ACTH levels done yearly. Um, and then uh, even uh, drawing insulin values too. So you can see if your horse is developing insulin resistance and PPID uh, over, over the, uh, as the horse gets older. So anyway. I can't say as far as um, what I've looked into uh, horses having PPAD issues and being treated on pergolite, I was interested to see at some point if there was any um, benefit to these horses having pergolite, which is a dopamine agonist, right? So um, there may, there was this thought process that there may be some um, performance benefit. Um, and in the research that I've looked at, there has been no I think to speak to the point that there is life after PPID um, diagnosis because all of these horses are still being competed with um, while they are on a pergolide treatment. Um, and to me, that just says that, yeah, as long as we manage these horses appropriately, we're feeding them appropriately, we're trying to reduce the incidence of, of secondary problems um, and watching how we feed them so it doesn't exacerbate any of the laminitic situations. These horses can have a very long productive life um, after diagnosis. We just need to be mindful of the way we manage them and, um, and be careful that we don't put them on ryegrass in the winter. <laughs> yeah, one of, one of the things in our study that we uh, then the pergolide trial, we did, uh, we fed, uh, uh, used a lot of horses that were school horses uh, in barns in, uh, in, in the Baton Rouge area. And one of the things that we did notice is a lot of these horses, they were, they had PPID and they were excellent kids horses. Uh, but once they treated them with pergolide, they started getting a little bit more spirited. And so some of them, they, the kids could ride them for because they were too, too feisty. So, um, so that's one of the things that, uh, you know, they're starting to feel better, you know, once they get, uh, once they start treatment. So uh, I think that's the reason why some people think it is performance enhancing uh, because they do, they shed out better. Uh, they just start feeling better uh, after, uh, during treatment. So. All right, final call. Anybody else have any other questions or uh, do you guys have any other thoughts that you'd like to share on the management of these horses before we end? All right, well then I, I really appreciate you guys coming on. I really appreciate um, everybody who's watched us with the live and, and on here on the Zoom meeting. Um, these actually end up, these little meetings end up being really informative and sharing a great way to share some research that we're doing at LSU and with all of our partnerships and other universities. Um, so I appreciate you guys spending your holiday with us. And um, if you have any other questions as stakeholders or as people who are managing um, horses with PPAD or any other type of equine management issues, feel free to reach out to any of us here at the LSU Ag Center or at the vet school. We're happy to help you um, see if we can't prolong the usefulness and the longevity of your horses. Um, so again, thank you everybody. Enjoy your holiday. Have a great Easter and hopefully we'll see you soon. All right, thank you, uh, Neely, right. Aaron, you're great. Thanks, Dr. Andrews, Neely.